Thank you. Praise the Lord. Good evening. Oh, it's good to be in church, isn't it? Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. There is a lot happening in the world. Would you agree with that? Uh, there's some moving and shaking. That is for sure. Um, I want to talk to you this evening. Before we go into the message and the word tonight, I want us to uh, pray together. And uh, I want to talk to you just a few minutes <clears throat> about the nation of Israel. Um, most of you um, have probably heard there's a lot going on there. There's attacks taking place. And uh, I've been in, in prayer concerning this, um, what's happening. And by no means am I an expert on the affairs of Israel. Uh, but I will say over the years, I've definitely read and I've learned and studied about this nation and about these people of Israel. And uh, I've seen the... the, the I, I've, it's just there's so much that, that, that has just happened concerning that nation. And, and you perhaps have heard and learned much of the same. But I've seen how over the years how this group of people has been enslaved. <laughs> they have been harassed. They have been persecuted. They've been hated on. They've made, been made fun of, provoked, attacked. And yet they remain. <laughs> they stand. They continue. Their resolve, their resilience, and their willingness to what I've seen to take the high road is absolutely extraordinary. And um, you say, well, what does that have to do with me? And there are a lot of Christians that, that really don't know what Israel has to do with, with themselves or may, perhaps their Christian faith um, or what it has to do with their everyday life. But as a Christian, really, the, the very basis of Christianity comes out of um, you know, out of the Abrahamic covenant and that covenant that was, was in that covenant, we know that, that the land of Canaan, the, the land that God promised Israel, that land, to me, you see how Israel is surrounded by nations that, that basically hate them. <laughs> it's It's crazy. <laughs> You see this, this small little nation that has been so attacked and the, the, the literally millions of Arabs and those that are around them that have, that have come up against them. And I'm thinking of one time in history, there are miracles, modern day miracles that have taken place that on, on biblical, biblical proportion and level that has protected that nation that most people have no idea even about. Uh, for example, just one that I'm thinking of was, it was when the nation of Israel was given back their land, um, and yet when they were given their land, no other country was allowed to help them or to protect them when that took place. They had to make it back to their land and defend their land after just coming out of the war. And, you know, what, four to six million, I think, uh, were, were killed in concentration camps. You know, I mean, and here they are going back to the land, just trying to migrate back to their land, and they're being attacked and bombed and blown up. And... They begin to assemble, without going into too much detail, the first Israeli Air Force. And how that came about was miraculous. And I could, I could tell you more about this, or I could tell you where to find more about this if you're interested. And they put together literally the parts of different aircraft to make an aircraft. And some guys that came out of the war here in the United States, secretly were assembled together, written letters, and said, we need your help. We know you know how to fly airplanes, and would you help us? And by them 
adhering to that call in their heart, and that's what they begin to say. Like, you know, we were Jewish, we were made fun of as being Jewish, but we didn't even practice Jewish customs. But something in my heart, something in here was like, this is what I'm on this planet to do. And here are these American Jews basically snuck over there with these put-together airplanes, and they dropped a bomb out of this airplane, and it happened to land by this Egyptian-like uh, leader's home, and there were 30,000 troops and tanks on the border that were just going to wipe out the nation of Israel off the face of the planet, seemingly, and yet that bomb scared them so bad, that leader so bad, that he halted all the Arab troops just a few miles from them, in which they had no means to even protect themselves. They literally had broomsticks and a few pistols <laughs> against tanks and heavy armory, but that bomb that, felt that they dropped out of that, that airplane, landed, scared them, they gave word to stop all that, those soldiers and retreat. I mean, this is something that could be like in our Bible that was amazing. And the, when I said the high road, um, I want to, in case you don't know, and I just, I think it's good, but I did see this, this um, little video of this British comm uh, commanding officer, and he just shared a little bit of his own testimony. And I just want to show this. I thought it was kind of relative to what, what we're seeing today and why we're going to pray for Israel, one of the reasons. Paul, could you play that video, please? There are two views of the Israeli military, what you hear in most of the media and the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. I was the commander of British forces in Afghanistan. I have fought in combat zones around the world, including Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Macedonia, and Iraq. I was also present throughout the conflict in Gaza in 2014. Based on my experience and on my observations, the Israel Defense Force, the IDF, does more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any other army in the history of warfare. Why is this so? Firstly, Israel is a decent country with Western values run on democratic principles. Israel has no more interest in war than Belgium does. In fact, Israel has never started a war. The only reason it ever goes to war is to defend itself. And it has to defend itself because unlike Belgium, it is surrounded by countries and armed groups that want to destroy it. Secondly, Judaism, with its unsurpassed moral standards, remains a major influence on the citizens of Israel. I say this as a non-Jew. Thirdly, the army is composed overwhelmingly of citizen soldiers. Israel is a small country with a small professional army. To fight a war, it depends on its conscripts and its reservists. These are ordinary citizens, from professors to plumbers, called upon to defend their homes. They don't want to be fighting, and they don't want to harm others. Nowhere was the essential morality and decency of the IDF more evident than in the Gaza War of 2014. If ever there was a purely defensive war, this was it. The war was started by Hamas, the terror organization, designated as such by the US State Department that runs the Gaza Strip. In the first six months of 2014, Hamas launched hundreds of rockets at Israeli civilians. After repeated warnings from Israel to stop, the Israeli Air Force finally conducted precision strikes to halt the rocket fire. And the IDF advanced into Gaza to destroy a network of terror tunnels that Hamas had constructed to attack Israeli communities near the Gaza border. The IDF took extraordinary measures to give Gaza civilians notice of targeted areas, dropping millions of leaflets, broadcasting radio messages, sending texts, and making tens of thousands of phone calls. Let me repeat that. 
the Israelis called Gazans on their cell phones and told them to leave their residences and move to safety. Never in the history of warfare has an army phoned its enemy and told them where they're going to drop their bombs. Many IDF missions that could have taken out Hamas military capabilities were aborted to prevent civilian casualties, increasing the risk to Israeli citizens and soldiers. Despite all of this, of course innocent civilians were killed. Every war is chaotic and confusing, and mistakes are frequent. But mistakes are not war crimes. Hamas, on the other hand, committed war crimes as official government policy. Hamas deliberately positioned its military assets among the civilian population, hiding weapons in schools and hospitals, and placing rocket launchers alongside apartment buildings, then forced those civilians to stay in areas they knew would be attacked. They also instructed their people to report the lie that every Gazan killed was a civilian, even if they were actually fighters. And if there were no civilian deaths, Hamas made them up. Numerous internet sites show Palestinians elaborately staging sniper victims and smashed ambulances, among other phony horrors. It's so common, there's even a term for it, Pallywood, as in Palestinian Hollywood. Ironically, it's the leaders of Hamas themselves who best understand the extraordinary measures the IDF will take to protect innocent civilians. They take full advantage of Israel's decency and adherence to the laws of war. No army takes such risks in order to protect civilians as the Israeli army does. I say this as a professional soldier. I say it because it's true. And people who care about truth should know it. I'm Colonel Richard Kemp for Prager University. Join Prager University. <laughs> Click here to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I just wanted you to see that because this war really is it's unlike other wars. This land is unlike any other land. <laughs> this is a people group unlike any other people group. And Satan hates the people of Israel. <laughs> and the enemy wants that land. And uh, so I just wanted you to pre present that to you because perhaps you knew that, perhaps you ha didn't know that. I, uh, I've seen multiple reports uh, that, that absolutely agree with his uh, report there. And, uh, and I've read many things and seen many things and heard many things. So I just want to say this because I think this is important for us as Christians. The Bible says um, that in Genesis 12, 3, t it tells us that we are to bless Israel. In Psalms 122, 6, Isaiah 62, 6, and Isaiah 41 and 2 tells us to comfort and to encourage them. And Isaiah 60 says that we are to assist them. God, he purposely placed Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, on this land. And this land is, is, it is it, it's such a high target. And the Bible tells us that God blesses those who bless his people, the Jewish people. People that bless them will be blessed. People that oppose them will be opposed. You see, there is a purpose in doing this. It's not just to be blessed. It, we do it because out of obedience and love for God. And this is very important, why we, why we stand with the nation of Israel. And uh, so I, I haven't talked much about this. Like I said, I'm not an expert on the subject by any means. I endeavor to learn and know more. But I definitely can tell you that something in my heart happened years ago for the people of Israel and for the Jewish people. And I can't explain it necessarily in words, but I just have a, 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 a yearning for them and a, and, a, and a call to pray for them. And so I hope and pray that that same spirit of love it, it comes to you and is in your heart 
and that you on a regular basis will pray for them. So I've called in an expert to pray, uh, my wife, <laughs> a, a commander of God's army. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> and uh, we were, uh, we were uh, there uh, sitting there, and I looked over at her notes. She had some notes. And I said, oh, I'm definitely going to pray before you. <laughs> I was going to steal her notes is what I was going to do. Praise God. No, but um, I just asked her to pray uh, this evening uh, for the people of Israel and for the nation of Israel. And uh, I'll pray as well. So if you want to speak to whatever you'd like to say. Um, I'll pray. You know, um, Jesus said that when these things come upon the earth, he, he said to look up, for your redemption draws nigh. He didn't say to look around. Mm. You know, we hear all these reports, and there's a lot of things to look around at and be distracted by. But Jesus didn't say look around. He said look up. And we can't r forget the power that resides within us right? And so it's important that we are, we are that anointing carriers in this earth, God's image bearers, and that we um, exercise the authority that we have, praise God. And so let's pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, you, Jesus. Praise Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for the protection of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. You said that whoever touches them touches the apple of your eye, for the Lord's portion is his people. And we thank you for your divine hand of protection upon Israel and its people. For we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for you said they shall prosper that love thee. We pray that the United States would stand with Israel. We pray for boldness in our leaders to stand unified with Israel. That God, you are dealing swiftly and justly with those who hate Israel and the Jewish people and who seek to destroy them. You cause the wicked to be snared in the work of their own hands, and we pray for your divine wisdom to Netanyahu and the leaders of Israel for divine solutions and insights that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, we thank you that you are revealing to them the things that they need to know and those things that are to come, and we bind principalities and powers over governments that would be against Israel. Heavenly Father, send confusion into their camps. Yeah. that they would be confounded and yeah. even turn upon themselves. We pray unity among the people of Israel and the divine flow of resources to them. Yes. You are God, the faithful God, and we thank you for your faithfulness in protecting the nation of Israel. Hallelujah. 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 And Father, we thank you, Lord, that as we, your people, come together, Father, that there is power that resides within us, Father, and we thank you for the authority that you have given us in this thank earth. You. We thank you that you have given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, that nothing shall by any means harm us. And Father, as we see these things coming upon the earth, Father, we look up. We look up. We thank keep you. our eyes single, for then our whole body will be filled with light. Father, we thank you, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, sweetheart. Appreciate it. Would anybody else like to pray? Or just kind of put that on my heart. Anybody else like opportunity to pray? You just raise your hand. Let me see you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just plead the blood of Jesus over the nation of Israel, over its people. And I bind every spirit of darkness that has ever been sent to destroy them. In the name of Jesus, I bind deception over the, that, that is trying to blind the minds of those who are set to destroy the nation of Israel and its people. And every plot, every plan, every scheme that the enemy has devised against that nation, against its people, will be uncovered, will be dismantled and destroyed. Reveal to those that are in power 
those who are in authority, those who are in control of Israel's defense, what needs to be done to protect that nation. Peace be with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Well, you have your Bible this evening? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 again. All right, all right. <laughs> oh, it's good to be a Christian, isn't it? I mean, it's great to be a Christian. Let's just face it. Come on, right? I mean, it's just amazing that we got saved, first of all. And then, and then not only are you get saved, now we're coming into the knowledge of his word, and we're growing in the knowledge of his word. We're growing in the knowledge of the authority of the word of God so that we can walk in the authority of the word of God. So we don't just have to just take it and just, you know, just, well, just shut up and take it, you know, just endure to the end. No, we can see that we have authority in the name of Jesus Christ, right? Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it, it, think about that. If, if you have a child and the child isn't feeling well, you don't have to sit there and go, oh, ho, ho, Lord, be your will. No, you can pray in the name and in the authority of the name of Jesus concerning your child. You can tell that sickness what to do, to go back to the pit of hell where it came from and to leave your child's body, right? Amen. Isn't that awesome that you know this? Not every Christian knows this, but you know it. You know it. Amen? Amen. And if you're, if you're being bombarded in your mind and your thoughts, you don't have to just sit there and go, well, I don't know. I guess this is just the way I think, just the way I am, just the way I, it's, it's got to be. No, you can say, no, 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 no. I, I take that thought. That, th- that thought's not even my thought. That's not my thought. That thought does not agree with God's word. That thought, I know where that thought came from. You identify where the thought came from and you you bring it into captivity, right? To the authority of Christ. And you say, nope, thought, you're not my thought. You didn't originate from me and you didn't originate from my God. So I'm casting this thought down. It's not my thought. I think on these things. And then you tell yourself what you're going to (laughs) think. I think on these things, things that are pure, things that are just, things that are lovely, things that are honest, things that are good report, this is what I think about. Isn't that great that you know this? Not every Christian knows this, but you know it. Amen? The authority of the word, the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is so much to know as a Christian, but thank God we know some things. (laughs) We're not where we were, right? We're further along than we were. We're further down the road than we were when we started. Yeah, we don't know it all, but we're further than we were, praise God. And we can pray. We can pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah. We can, when we don't know what to say with our natural words, we can pray, and out of our belly can flow rivers of living water, and we can pray mysteries. We can pray things out in the Spirit, and things our spirit can be just charged, revitalized. It, it can just bring us such life. And guess what? Glory to God, you are praying the answer. And it I'm just going to say, it confuses the hell out of Satan and his demons. Because he doesn't know what you're saying. And there's nothing he wants more is to you just to stay in the natural. Just stay natural. Just stay just stay grounded now. Just stay nat. No, no. Don't get over in that super spiritual thing. You know, you don't want to be so spiritual that you're that you're no earthly good. Well yeah you do. It's all about the spiritual. Out of the spiritual is how we learn to live in the natural. Praise God, hallelujah, for the spiritual. This is a spiritual book. You serve a spiritual God, and His Spirit is dwelling in you. you. You're born of His Spirit. And that's that same spirit of faith that you and I have. Amen? You know, have you ever, you've heard of, let's just think about the word spirit before we go in to read this. 
you know, well, actually, let's read it first. Let's read it together. What, let's read that. Um, you got it up there? Yeah, let's read it. Ready? We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now, I remember, <laughs> I grew up in a, in a I'm going to say it like this, a very Christian home, okay? It wasn't a little Christian home, it was very Christian, all right? It was pretty strict Christian home, and I thank God for it. I said, I thank God for it. And parents, don't think that you're being too strict on your kids, all right? Well, I don't want to force it on them. <laughs> we're not talking about forcing, we're talking about training them. Sometimes training is forceful. <laughs> but you're saying, hey, for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And this is how we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to mealy mouse around about it. We're not going to prance around it. We're not going to sit there and go, well, you know, I'm just going to let you make up your own mind. And when you get to age, I'll let you figure it out. No, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this is how to live. And yes, you're going to make your own decision, but this is how a believer lives. This is how a Christian is supposed to live. Amen. Hallelujah. Great enthusiasm in here of all the parents, right? Praise God. Well, this is sometimes we, because listen, the world, the world tries to suck us into this belief and way of thinking that it's just, it's just, I don't know how to say it. It's like marshmallow Christianity. That, that there's no strong Christians that come out of that. You need strong Christian young people. Amen? Well, what makes a strong Christian young person is the same thing that makes a strong Christian old person, and it's knowledge on the truth of the Word of God. Amen? We don't need to deviate it. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to make it, like, cute. It's just the Word. And thank God that David had this understanding because this is what we just read from the Apostle Paul referring to the psalmist David. We having the same spirit of faith, right? And so when you think about this spirit of faith, um, not only is, could it be referred to as the, the Holy Spirit, right? The spirit of God, the spirit of faith, but the spirit of a thing. So I'm saying this because when, I, when we moved to Florida, and I remember I, I went to a public school, and I had, wasn't used to going to public school. I had attended um, twice before I was, when I was younger in elementary school, but then we moved to Florida, and I went to public high school. And now that was a whole another world for this guy, all right? Talk about culture shock. That was culture shock for me, okay? And I remember they were going to have spirit, spirit day, maybe, or spirit week, right? Well, the only spirit this guy knew was the Holy Spirit. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. Public school, they have Spirit Week, you know. Had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, to let you know. <laughs> but I, I didn't even, I, I couldn't, I'm just telling you, like the word spirit to me automatically was attached to God. Spirit of what? But, you know, because I was young and dumb, right? So, I mean, in some areas, like, the, you could say, like, you think about, like, the spirit of something, the spirit of a school, or remember the spirit of St. Louis, right? This, this airplane is going to fly across the Atlantic, right? So what is it? It's like, it's like, you know, hey, it's togetherness, right? And he talks about this same spirit of faith. I pray that this church has that spirit of faith in it, right? So if you're in here, you're hearing about the spirit of faith. But if you're in your lobby talking to somebody, the same spirit of faith is coming out and in the conversation of the people. If you're in the bathroom talking to somebody, it's the same spirit of faith, you know what I mean? Because this campus just has a spirit of faith about it. It's kind of like this can-do spirit. But it's not a can-do it by it yourself. It's a can-do it with God. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen? And I pray that this same spirit of faith is in your home. And that you carry this same spirit of faith into the schoolroom, into the classroom, into the boardroom, right? 
into the shopping centers and, and wherever you're at, you have this same spirit of faith. And when you communicate to those people around you, family members, friends, co-workers, you're a carrier of this spirit of faith. Hallelujah. We having the same spirit of faith. Let me read this in the uh, other translations. I haven't done that in previous weeks. But it says, we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. I like that. It's like he says, I believe in God, so I spoke. Now think about that. I believe in God, so I spoke. I go back to the story that I've told many times to this church, and I was in the same school, ninth grade, public school, and I think there was like 1,500 students there. I hadn't seen 1,500 pe young people assembled together ever in my life. <laughs> and so coming to this school was pretty overwhelming. And I remember as a freshman in high school, this, this kid began to pick, pick on us and pick on me and one of my buddies. Uh, you know, we were just little guys, ninth grade. And this kid, he was, he was mean, he was being a bully, you know. He'd, he'd shove us and he'd hit us and whack us in the head and just stupid stuff, you know. He's an upperclassman. And I remember what happened one day because one of my best friends had an older brother at that same school who was a senior. Uh, I knew he had a brother, but I didn't really know his brother that well. Well, his brother happened to be the biggest kid in the entire high school. This kid was a monster. I mean, he was just giant. I mean, he had, you know, professional baseball player after that, you know, drafted out of high school and so forth. But all of a sudden, the bully stopped bullying us because my friend, who was getting bullied as well, told his brother, hey, this kid's picking on us. So his brother paid this kid a little visit and said, hey, you're picking on my, my little brother and his friends. Knock it off. That's all it took. That kid knocked it off. Now this bully is going, hey, what's up? And he's trying to high-five us in the hallway instead of punch us in the hallway. Well, <laughs> it reminds me of the psalmist here, what it was said here. He said that I believe in God, so I spoke. Well, my friend Robbie's big brother's name was Sean. I believe in Sean, so I spoke. <laughs> See, I could say things to the bully now that I wouldn't have said before because of my friend's big brother. And I'm just telling you, you don't have to let the enemy intimidate you. You don't have to let cancer and sickness intimidate you. You don't have to let anything, any bit of the curse, discouragement, any lies of the devil discourage you because you believe in God. Speak. You can speak because of who God is and who you are as a child of God. If God be for you, who can be against you? And this is the spirit of faith that David spoke from. I believe in God, so I spoke. You remember, David was, he was, he was talking against God, defying God, defying the covenant they had, and he's like, hey, I believe in God. And because of his belief in God, he spoke to Goliath. No one else was speaking to Goliath, but he spoke to Goliath. Why? That same spirit of faith. And that same spirit of faith that was in him is the same spirit of faith that's in you and I. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Listen to the amplifier, or no, the message. It says, we're not keeping this quiet, not on your life. Just like the psalmist who wrote, I believe it, so I said it. We say what we believe. <laughs> we say what we believe. I like what uh, Minister Mark Hankins said. He said, and my wife reminded me, of, he said, if your faith can't move your mouth, then your faith won't move your mountain. 
If you can't even get your faith to move your mouth, or you think you're going to, the mountain's just going to stay there because the only way the mountain moves is through your mouth. Hallelujah. Amen? Remember in Luke, we said, uh, we looked last week in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, what you say flows from what is in your heart. And that is exactly what David did. What he said was flowing from what was in his heart. That is the same spirit of faith that you and I have. And when you are filled, I, I say it like this, when you are filled with this faith, you almost can't help for it to flow out of your mouth. Let me ask you this. Have you ever said something stupid and you wish you wouldn't have said it and as soon as you say it, you almost slap your hands over your mouth? I've done it. Most of you have done it, right? But I've found, I've truly found this, that you can get to the place where the Word of God is so big in you, and it's just, put your, it's just going in you, going in you, going in you, that you will, some, you'll hear something, you'll see something, something will happen, and out of your mouth will come words of faith and life and hope and love. It'll just come out of your mouth, and you go, oh, <laughs> you didn't even think about it. It like, it just bypassed your thinking, if you will, and it just came right out. And I really, truly believe this is how we are designed to function. It's how we're designed to work. Remember, out of a good man, good treasure, right? Good things come out of your mouth. The treasure has to be deposited. For the treasure to be there, it needs to be deposited. We need to deposit these things on the inside of us. If we want that to come out, if we want to make a withdrawal, there has to first be a deposit. In the banking system, it works the same way, right? You can't go to some bank that you've never made a deposit and say, I'd like to make a withdrawal. They go, uh, of what, do you have an account? Well, no, but I'd just like to make a withdrawal. No, it's called a loan, okay? Right? That's called a loan. That's not a withdrawal. But if you go to the bank that you've made deposit in, you can go up there and literally demand a withdrawal. Right. Why? Because you made a deposit. And when you make deposits of God's word in your heart, when you have need of it, you can make a withdrawal. And I found that when it's in there in abundance, it just flows out of your mouth. And it begins to affect the way you think. It begins to affect the way you talk. It affects the way you believe. And this is what we have to do after the new birth. We have to grow in the knowledge of this way of living. We have to grow and, and, and understand, listen, just because I'm saved doesn't mean everything's automatic. Why is that? Because I have authority here as a child of God, and that authority, I must exercise that authority as a believer on the earth. That was worth coming here tonight, just to hear. Just so you know that, right? Now, don't, don't miss these things. Don't leave here and wonder why, why you're suffering, why you're in pain, why you're dealing with things, and you can't figure out, you know, why is this not working? I'm telling you the answer right now. You believe? How do you believe? Well, you put the Word of God in your heart to be able to have that believing there. See, you believe based on what you know. You believe based on the revelation knowledge that you get from the Word. It's how you believe in healing. There are some churches that believe in salvation, but they don't believe in healing. Guess what? Not a lot of people get healed at those churches. Very few get healed at those kind of churches. Why? Because they don't believe in it. But you go to a church like this, people get healed. Why? Well, because we believe. It's not because we're special. It's not because God loves us more than he loves them. God loves us all equally. But you have to have knowledge of it. And you have to have revelation knowledge of it. When, when, when the word of God is revealed to you in your heart, this isn't just head knowledge. When I say revelation, it's revealed knowledge to your spirit. Then you begin to exercise faith in that. There are some churches that don't even really talk about or preach the new birth. Are people getting saved there? No, very few. Why? Because they don't preach on it. They don't believe in it. 
And you can go on and on. Talk about prosperity, you can talk about healing, you can talk about deliverance, you know, you can talk about freedom from, from guilt and shame and all this. Why? When you, get, when you grow in the knowledge of the Word, then you begin to say, hey, guess what? I don't have to live like that forever because Christ redeemed me from that. This is very powerful. Remember Jesus, uh, the Word of God says, uh, I'm trying to remember where it's at, he says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And then it says that some reject knowledge. Well, there are people who reject knowledge. There are people that have heard about healing, but they reject healing because they think healing's passed away. It's just like they think tongues has passed away, but it's not. You can't come to me and tell me that tongues has passed away. Why? Because I can pray in the Spirit. I mean, if I'm praying in the Spirit, then how has it passed away? It's not passed away. I started this teaching by talking about how the enemy comes after anything that's powerful. He hates power. He's afraid of power. And he's afraid that a child of God will exercise power and authority. So what does he do? He tries to bring deception in all these areas in Christian, in Christian life to keep people away from the, from the power. First of all, he doesn't want people saved. So then he, sta he starts getting, you know, he starts putting pressure on the enemy. Hey, listen, the enemy, there's wiles of the enemy. Wiles are clever tricks of the enemy. And literally, he's been working thousands of years to deceive people, by the way. He's very clever at it. I'll give him that much. He is very clever at it. And so if he can keep people from the new birth, he'll start right there. That's the first thing he wants to keep them from. But even if a person gets saved, now what's he want to do? He wants to keep any form of power away from that person, away from that child of God. Because he knows once a child of God discovers the power and authority of the word of God that they can walk and operate in the earth, he can't stop them. Satan can't stop the church. He has no legal authority to stop the church. The only thing he can try to do is deceive God's people into thinking they don't have any power. Now, the power that we had, God gave us his power. It's his authority that he's vested in us and given us the authority. It's like the police officer who goes on the street. Well, it's not their own power and authority. They're, they're, they've been given the authority of the precinct in which they serve. See, we serve the Almighty God. And so the authority that we operate in is his authority on the earth. It's the authority of Jesus Christ who defeated Satan. And for this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that he might destroy the works of the enemy. And so what are we doing? We're enforcing what Jesus bought and paid for. We say, no, devil, you're trespassing. Remember, he's described as a thief. John 10, 10, you know that verse. The thief cometh but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, right? He's a thief. Thieves don't ask permission. Have you ever had your identity stolen? Have you had anybody try to steal, uh, use your credit card? Almost everyone in the room probably has, right? Did the person who stole your credit card information, did they call you up and say, hey, I just stole your information, just want to let you know I'm going to use it in a gas station in Miami. <laughs> They're thieves. Satan doesn't do that either. He tries to steal your identity. He tries to use your identity. He tries, he, he's an identity thief. He doesn't want you to know who you are in Christ Jesus. That's my calling, is to teach you who you are in Christ Jesus. That's my calling, is to teach you who you are in Christ Jesus. How? Through the Word of God. Because in that Word is everything you need to know about who you are in Christ Jesus. And you have the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, conveying those very promises. So you can't even sit here and say, well, I, I don't understand the Bible, because you have the author, who is the Holy Spirit, of the book dwelling in you. So even if I don't do a good enough job, you have the very author of the Holy Spirit in you, who is the convictor and the conveyor of the promises of God. And he'll show you the authority that you have if you just use faith when you read the Bible. You have to read the Bible in faith because it is a spiritual book. All spiritual things are revealed to you by faith. You don't understand spiritual principles by intellectualism. 
if that was the case, the, 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 the intellects of our university would be all saved and filled with the Spirit. But they're not. There's more atheists, professors, in our universities than ever before. A study was just put out and uh, Andrew Womack got a hold of that study and he talked about a biblical worldview and he talked about how many professors in our colleges and universities are now atheists. They say they don't even believe in God. Well, that's not by coincidence. That's by design of the enemy to try to put people that are influencers in your children's lives at an early age, at a pivotal age, that don't believe in God. So what? So to try to get people to believe more in intellectualism than in the power of God. Remember what Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You know, the Greeks were very intellectual people. They weren't stupid, they were very intellectual people. But their intellectualism didn't bring them closer to Christ. The power of God did. Praise God. All right? How does faith work? Faith works by believing and speaking. Say it with me. Faith works by believing and speaking. So how do you receive your healing? By believing and speaking. Right? It's the same way you received your salvation. You confessed with your mouth and you believed in your heart. That's how faith works. It's the same way, like, like Jimmy was just ministering on, it's the same, he said, most people don't use these scripture verses, they don't think of these scripture verses when they think of finances or giving or tithing, but it's the same principles that apply to faith. When you give, you give not with, with, with a reluctant heart or, or with, with you know, a downtrodden heart or discouragement or, oh man, there goes 10%. No. No. You sow, you believe, and you speak. Every time I sow, I give of my finances in the offering basket, I speak to it. Jeff talked about this years ago. He used to put his giving on auto pay, which you could do. I'm not saying not to do that. It's up to you. But the Lord, for him, revealed to him that by doing that, he, was, he wasn't saying over it because it was just automatically giving. And so for him, he drew that back, and he was physically making himself write checks so he would remember to speak over it. Now, I'm not saying you can't auto-pay. It was just for him. It was something that the Lord was dealing with him. Hey, it's not just about the giving. It's about the speaking. It's about the saying. Amen. And so we say these things. When I give, I said... Lord, I, I, I give, I thank God that it is, I give, it is given unto me, pressed down, good measure, shaken together and running over. Seed, you go and grow, and you come back to me a hundredfold. I, I tell the seed what to do. Well, as a farmer, I do the same thing, essentially. The seeds, I just got an order of seeds that are on my desk right now, and we, I, we sowed about half of them this season, we'll sow the other half next season, but guess what? I basically, I told the seed what to do by sowing the seed. And I'm telling it what to do by watering it and fertilizing it. The seed just by itself doesn't know what to do. But the seed in the hands of somebody that knows what to do it, you know what some people could do? You could eat the seed. There is some nutritional value in the seed. Small amount. And if I was starving and I didn't know any better, I might eat the seed. But with knowledge of the seed, I can sow the seed and get fruit and many more seeds. That's the same thing with finances. That's the, it's exactly why the enemy doesn't want you to give. Why? Because you'll eat your seed. If you eat your seed... You got to live off the seed. Who wants to live off the seed? I'd rather live off the fruit, and there's plenty of seed in the fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold are in the room. Hmm. All right. What I'm getting at here is agreement. With faith, faith 
is the highest level of agreement that a Christian can exercise. I'm going to say that again. Faith is the highest level of agreement that a Christian can exercise. And what this agreement is, this great agreement, is agreement with a person's believing and their saying. And when the two agree, they're powerful. In the book of Amos, it says in Amos chapter 1, or no, no, Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, can two walk together except they agree? There must be an agreement. There, there must be an agreement where our faith is concerned. It is one of the, it's one of the highest level uh, of, of, of things we can do in this agreement of our believing and our speaking. Go to Matthew 18, 19. Look at this agreement. Agreement is big with God. God is really big on agreement. Matthew 18, 19 says, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth, agree, say agree. agree. He says, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Do you ever notice how Satan hates agreement? Do you ever notice how we have really had to ramp up agreements? Agreements, we've got an, a, a, an agreement on a piece of property that was made, I think, in the 1950s or 60s. This agreement is with um, Duke Energy, and this agreement is two sentences on one piece of paper over a piece of property. You would not find an agreement with Duke Energy that big today on a piece of property, but that's the way agreements were made. How about a simple agreement to use an app on your phone. You ever see that? <laughs> agree. Are you kidding me? What did I just agree to? Nobody knows. Right? So you see, it's like we have to agree to the provider what they're giving us, and the agreements are just crazy to the point that nobody even reads them anymore. Why? Because there's been such a breaking in our society away from agreements. And this agreement is a God thing. God is big on agreement. And he wants what you believe and what you say, this is the very foundation of this, the very basics of this, to agree. It doesn't do you any good to say one thing and think you're believing another thing. I've, I've taught you this and trained you to, over the years. One of the things that the Lord dealt with me on is I don't no. I found myself saying that like hundreds of times. And it was so natural and regular for me to say it that I would say it over and over again in a given conversation. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know, but, well, you know, I, I don't know, but, well, you know, I don't know. And it was like one day the Holy Spirit just said, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, it just became part of my conversation. You know, like, let me just give you an example. Like, maybe I'd be talking to my employees, and, and we would talk about a piece of equipment, and they'd say, you know, this is going on with it. And they'd tell me maybe a symptom that was going on and happening to it, and I'd say, well, you know, I don't know, but uh, maybe try this. And I would just, see, it just came out so natural to me. And I would talk about 
just about anything I would talk about would say, well, you know, I don't really know, but why don't you try that? Well, I don't really know. Well, I don't really know. And the Lord was like, why do you keep saying you don't really know? If you continually confess you don't know, how are you ever going to know? There's no belief in saying I don't know. Now, my mind, my flesh wanted to go, well, I don't know. And you might be thinking, well, if I don't know, then I don't know, Pastor. I'm not going to say I know if I don't know. Well, see, there's no faith in that. I mean, really, you have to say, you see, see if, I'm, if I'm believing, and what the Lord took me to was in the book of James about wisdom. <laughs> he said, if you lack wisdom, ask of me. He didn't say, go to your head and see if you got it. Obviously, you don't have it. That's why you lack the wisdom. But he said, if you lack wisdom... Ask of me, and I will give it to you, and I'll pour it out to you liberally, liberally and I upbraid it not. I'm not holding it back. He said, but when you ask, but when you ask, ask in faith, believing. And so I knew I had to make a decision. That even if I didn't know the answer to something, I had to stop saying, I don't know. I had to start saying, it'll come to me. I'll find out. It'll be revealed to me. These are some of the things that now I have begun to say. So what am I doing? What is happening? The Holy Spirit is teaching me. He's the great teacher. He's our help. Say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. is my help. Now, you, you, don't sit here and laugh at these things and think these things are insignificant for your life. They're more significant than you may ever realize. Remember the scripture verse says, the little foxes spoil the vine? It's like there are little things, little way, areas of deception that the enemy just sort of boop, bumps us off track and then we wander around over here and wonder why in the world are we not getting the answers? Why in the world do we keep wandering around and circling and circling and circling? And it's, it, it, it frustrates us. It, it can get frustrating. But just come back and say, you know what? <laughs> I believe, I receive the wisdom of God concerning this situation for my life. I believe, I receive the wisdom of God concerning this. And then I go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe I receive it in Jesus' name. What is, what's going on here? Agreeing. Now my believing and my speaking are now agreeing. We believe, therefore we speak. David didn't believe one thing about his covenant and say something else. David didn't say, boy, that, that, that's a big boy over there. He's corn-fed for sure. <laughs> How in the world does somebody get that tall? Do you see the size of his feet? My goodness gracious. I'd hate to be the sandal maker. <laughs> Look at the size of the shield. You know, he had somebody carrying his shield. I still want to know what happened to that guy. <laughs> you ever think about that? But what he believed and what he spoke agreed. There's power in this. Yeah. If two of you agree on earth concerning anything, <laughs> anything, you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. That's powerful. That's powerful. Go over to Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Do you remember what happened in the book of Acts? Something very significant. You remember that upper room in the book of Acts? You do read the book of Acts, right? <laughs> and you remember in that upper room, it talked about that they were in one accord and they're in one mind. You know, that is when the entrance of the Holy Spirit came into the earth's realm. 
It said, and all these with their minds in full agreement devoted themselves steadfastly to prayer, waiting together with women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. In full agreement. Say in agreement. agreement. Next time you have a disagreement, I want you to think about how the enemy is big on disagreement, but God is big on agreement. Okay? Go to Genesis 11, verse 1. You get something out of this? What's God big on? What's the enemy want you to do? Disagree. It says at one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. Isn't that something? It says, as the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylon, or Babylonia, and settled there. And they began saying to each other, Let us, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united. Now you might, if you don't know better, you say, well, this is a good thing, right? No, because they were united for evil. These people were against God. And it says, and they all spake the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. You see, good or bad, agreement works. And God recognizes and shows us this. That's why when Pastor Angie prayed, one of the things she said was she talked about that there would be confusion being sent into their camp. That's powerful. That's powerful. We pray that confusion would be sent into the camp of the Hamas, into the camp of the enemy. They wouldn't be able to even organize, put it together. They think they got plans. Plans don't work. All of a sudden, communication doesn't work. This is good. This happened. And that's going to happen. Stories you'll never even hear about, but happen because Christians and believers came together here in Tarpon Springs and prayed in greed. You say, well, you really think it works like that? I know it works like that, people. And we just read scripture that says, if two of you come together, pray and agree concerning anything, my Father will do it. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. Jake, his wife, Angel, she said something years ago, and I held to it. It's happening as you speak. It's happening as you speak. That, there's, that was such a powerful revelation when she said that. It's happening as you speak. See, we have this belief, but when we speak, that's when the happening starts happening. <laughs> you remember Paul and Silas? Do you remember what happened to them? Here they are, they're beaten, they bound their hands. They bind their feet, and it says they put them in the lower dungeon of the prison. You remember that? Here they are in prison, beaten, <laughs> bound, <laughs> and unable to, to, to seemingly go anywhere. Yet something happens while they're bound hand and foot, beaten 
And in the lower dungeon, or that it's called the inner dungeon, it says that Paul and Silas, I'm reading Acts 16, verse 25, begin to pray and sing hymns to God, and the other prisoners heard them. What's going on? They're believing and they're speaking. Right? And as they're believing and speaking, it says suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. You know, some things there that happen. Here they're in this inner dungeon, probably solitary confinement, you could probably call it that today, and they begin to sing and praise God. It's like the devil had them bloody, the devil had them bound, but the devil forgot to gag their mouth. <laughs> and they didn't just sing this little song so that each of them could hear it. They were singing so that the other prisoners could hear it. And you got to kind of ask yourself the question if they didn't join in. Because when the earthquake began to shake, hey, earthquakes can happen. That doesn't mean the chains fall off your hands. This was the power of God, people. When the power of God hit that place, you got to ask yourself the question, did they join in on the singing? And if they joined in on the singing, it's probably why the chains fell off of them. You might come to church, and you might feel bound, and you might feel beaten, you might feel broken, or whatever the case may be. But when you begin to hear other saints of God begin to sing unto God, come on, amen? And you begin to lift up your voice, and get in harmony, and join in to what they're saying. Go ahead, you can sing, play something. Play something a little exciting here, right? As if it was Paul and Silas. I'm putting some pressure on you, all right? <laughs> then all of a sudden, you can feel what was, what was weighing you down, what was holding you down, what was bringing discouragement to you, now all of a sudden begins to fall off. Begins to fall off to the point that you're free. You're free. You're free. You're free. Believing and speaking. Agreement. This is powerful. This is how our faith works. By believing and speaking. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. You know, Jeff demonstrated on Sunday with Elizabeth's husband who went when she conceived, how the Lord sealed his mouth so he couldn't speak, right? Until after that baby was born. Why? Because it works in the reverse. We're getting a hold of this. We're being reminded of this. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for the power of agreement and that you and I I can agree with your word. I can speak your word. And as I believe and as I speak, I thank you, Lord, that cancers fall off, disappear, dissolve, go away. I thank you, Lord, that discouragement falls off, disappears, go away. Any sickness, any disease, any infirmity of the devil, any trace of the curse, gone from their life in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that relationships are restored, marriages are restored, minds are restored, bodies are restored, and I thank you, Lord, that your glory, your glory, your glory fills this place in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that as people walk into this sanctuary, come on to this campus in the name of Jesus Christ, that your glory is evident, that lives are changed, that lives are, 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 are turned around those who have been in a dark place that there's a, suddenly a light that comes in the name of Jesus Christ oh thank you Lord we walk in your light we live in your light 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every lie, every snare, every wile, every trick, exposed, brought to the light. The entrance of your word, it brings light in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that we're seeing it happen. It's happening as we speak. It's happening as we pray. It's happening as we agree in the name of Jesus. Oh, there's a mighty move. There's a move of the power and the Spirit of God in our midst. We yield our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, to hear, to receive of you. I thank you, Lord, that our young people even the babies in the nursery are sensing the very power and move of God in this place in Jesus' name. That our young adults, our youth, our college and career, the very presence and power of the anointing of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just lift up your voice. Let's just pray for a minute here. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for thank you. Thank you for light. Thank you for your word. Thank you, thank you for your promises. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. You know, when we were in praise and worship, I, had, I, I, I just saw this in my spirit. Some of you in your Christian walk and faith it's like you're looking up a hill. And you're looking up a hill and you're just waiting to get, to arrive to this pinnacle, to this place. But it's like, it's hard. It's hard for you to see. It's, it, you're trying to believe and, and have hope. Uh, uh. And the verse that came to me during praise and worship, and I didn't know if I was going to share it today or in the future, but I'm pray the Lord just had reminded me of it now for you. It says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe say that's me according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, 
the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You are in him. He's the head of the church. We are seated with him in heavenly places. And the Lord would just have me to tell you, you're seeing it wrong. I said, you're seeing it wrong. Stop looking like you can't, like you barely have hope to try to make it to the top, but to begin to see yourself at the top and that everything is under your feet and that your spiritual paradigm would switch and move and you would see yourself in this position of authority rather than trying to get the authority. See yourself in a position of victory rather than trying to get the victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You see, now when you're believing, your faith and your speaking agree, you'll begin to see yourself at the top rather than trying to get to the top. And when you see yourself at the top, you see yourself with authority rather than trying to get authority. You see yourself as restored rather than trying to get restored. You see yourself healed rather than trying to get healed. You see yourself prosperous rather than trying to get prosperity. And I know it may seem like they're similar, but they're not. There's a difference, and the difference is the finished work of Christ. The finished work of Christ is what put you in that position. And now you can begin to believe and speak from a different position that the enemy doesn't want you to believe and speak from. He wants you to keep trying to make your way up to the top rather than being at the top with him in heavenly places. And that's powerful for your life. Hallelujah. Hey, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as I dismiss, come up here to the front. We'll pray with you. Believe God. If you'd like prayer in any area of your life, if you're watching online, please contact our ministry so we can connect with you and get you some free resources and pray with you. Remember that you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Bless going in, bless going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. If you're good looking, you're dismissed. We'll see you Sunday.